Lack of time is the most common barrier to evidence-based physiotherapy. In this video, clinicians share some strategies they use to tackle the barrier of lack of time. Time is really a barrier, but I don't want us as therapists to be down or brought down by the fact that Ish, we don't have time. Everybody in life does not have time, but we try and accommodate and do what we can within the time that we are giving. Be very important, it's quality over quantity. <laughs> so they need to deliver effective services to the people so that they help the people that they're rendering the services to. So I think where guidelines exist, we have the luxury of going straight to the source of what is the most important evidence that I need to know for my clinical practice. I've been lucky enough to be part of the guideline committee for a couple of the guidelines. It is such a rigorous process, which means that as clinical physios, we can really trust in what the guidelines are telling us. My other um, favourite personal strategy is actually Pedro's evidence in your inbox mm -hmm. because I think the really nice thing about that is it, it sends it to your email very regularly and it also tells you what type of evidence it is within the email so you can quickly make a judgement. What should I have a look at here? So I'll always look at the systematic review evidence because it's got most potential to be strong enough to change what I do in clinical practice. That regular in-service once a fortnight for their staff, but we've tweaked this a little bit in terms of it just being everyone getting together and us presenting a bit. We, we often regularly identify an area what the junior staff have brought to us that was an area they were maybe lacking knowledge in not understanding or an area where we've highlighted that they need to go investigate and set them a task of bringing that up-to-date research back to the group as a whole and presenting. If at the time we've got no topic that has highlighted to anyone, the staff also all have one of the articles to present from the Pedro in, the, in your inbox feed. So when we see a key important, important article relevant to our patient load, we hand this off to a junior staff and say, look, we should assess this and then also look into the field a bit more and bring that back to the group as a whole. All of our articles and the papers we identify as being relevant to our cohort, key and important, we have a local database on our server. So anything that comes into those presentations or when we find key things doing our own personal research, we put that in there. So there's always a, I guess, an easy to access local database of relevant articles. I think that the main strategy that I successfully, I think, implemented was uh, to systematically dedicate two mornings uh, a week to reading new articles only for that. And furthermore, the, the second strategy was to clinically specialize to specific fields in musculoskeletal care and to read um, mainly literature uh, concerning these fields. So I've been quite fortunate that within the hospitals I've worked in that we've all had some type of journal club or, or time where a group of clinicians have been able to come together to discuss articles and, late, and the latest evidence within physio. Now, I really think where this has probably been most successful in changing or implementing evidence-based practice is when there's a particular focus over a period of time on a specific area of physio or, or trying to answer specific questions. So I think a really good example of this comes from my time at Banks and Lincoln Hospital, where as a team, we identified the need to improve interventions for balance for our inpatient cohort. We worked together over a few months, identifying what we needed to change, doing the literature search, you know, finding and analysing the evidence. Then once we found the evidence, as a group working together to firstly identify how we could deliver it to this population, but also equally how we could still deliver it within our busy work schedules. As a group, we worked together to try the group setting and saw what worked with us, what didn't work. As we then became more and more confident, we started then implementing this out to patients and started providing this as an exercise group to patients as well. And as we continued to learn, continue to make changes and also learn how it was most effective to, to keep going within our usual day. 
I think for me to overcome this barrier, regularity is one of the most important thing which I felt it uh, has worked wonders for me. Reading regular articles and regularly seeking for evidence mm -hmm. make me more efficient in finding them when I need it. Regular reading also made me more efficient to comprehend the literature. It took me lesser time to understand what it was written in the literature. Mm -hmm. So I think regular reading makes you more efficient for seeking evidence. I was always found in my hospital taking a pencil and a new article every day. I was always seen like that. Even if, not, if I'm not reading it, it was kept inside my pocket, sticking out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. I've always seen with the evidences in my hands. Accessibility of evidences all the time. You are going to get some time in the day to get into those evidence or to get through them. I already told you that we spend, you know, one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening for traveling. What I usually do is I download the PDF version of the article or the paper in my uh, cell phone. And then I read that uh, during my travel. Someone said to me, it's not that you don't have time. You need to reframe it. You actually need to make time to do that. You have a diary. I would suggest you use it and make time for it. Schedule it in, book ahead and just make it part of a regular discourse. Even just talking about it lessens the perhaps the overwhelming sense that it's too big or too complex or too scary to attempt while you're trying to do all your clinical work. So making time. Know what you don't know and know that you can go and find out the answer to everything else. That's step one. Mm -hmm. Step two would be to take action on that. So you know what you don't know, either have colleagues or friends that can help answer these things for you or make a group, find a way of, of disseminating this evidence or follow people on social media that are going to help you to do that. I keep track of what tends to be going on in the overall research world through Twitter. Now, Twitter is a very controversial area and it's important to not just listen to whoever yells the loudest rather than following physiotherapy personalities, I shall say. I tend to look at the, the literature that I find has been really meaningful and then follow those researchers. That becomes really useful in that you find when, it, when they are releasing a new paper or a point of discussion, you'll also see what, what they're engaging in. It's a little bit more of a biased view, but I'm able to follow at least the opinion of those people. I think that's a real risk sometimes for novice clinicians because they can be very much led astray by the loudest person in the room. But if people take the time to achieve a well-rounded point of view on some of these social media avenues, I think it can still be really useful for highlighting what you may then want to go and read. And it's important then to follow up these things with reading the paper, not just with reading the discussion around it. The campaign is supported by World Physiotherapy and physiotherapy organisations in Australia, Italy, France and the Netherlands.